Welcome, everybody. We have a ton to get into today. I'm seeing lots of love for our upcoming guest here on the chats and restreams. Uh, a guest, of course, is Viva Fry. He can be seen on vivabarnslaw.locals.com, where you want to check out his show, and a lot of a lot of people do. His um, real name is Freiheit, a really Freiheiter. We found out during the during the time before the, the mics heated up. But we got a lot to get into today. One of the things we're going to be talking about is Canada's uh, consideration of taking away some of the parental consent. Uh, maybe all parental consent as it pertains to euthanasia of children, which is a, a very um, emotional topic and should be interesting to get into. Of course, also, Dr. Kelly Victory is here today as always. Well, not as always. This is actually a different day for her. She will be here tomorrow again. We have Dr. Lytle, I think you pronounce his name as. You've seen him on the videos where he was being uh, escorted by security out of hospital uh, administration meetings. But today, from Dr. Victory's uh, uh, side, she'll be addressing some of the unfuck it bucket issues that she wants to get into. So stay with us. We'll get right to it. Our laws as it pertain to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin. Ridiculous. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Welcome, everybody. Susan is already very upset because I, I got a little burn on my cheek here from uh, essentially it's New York water that does it to me a lot of the time. And so uh, she wanted to put makeup on me and I objected. So now the fact that people are noticing it has her very upset. So I thought we'd get that out of the way right up. I front. wanted to give you the anti redness cream. Well, let, let's bring it on in. Okay. We'll put it on during the show, uh, during during the ad for certainly. So uh, again, Kelly will be here in a, in a few minutes and she'll be talking to Viva Fry as well and get into some of her unfuck it bucket topics. As you know, uh, we came upon this some weeks ago trying to decide now that things are where the, you know, where the government overreach has gotten us, where all the in infinite wisdom of our uh, regulatory organizations have gotten us here, what do we do to help people get better? So let's bring Viva Fry on in. Viva, welcome to the program. There Thank you, are. you very much for having me. Yep, I'm here. Look at that. It's a How privilege. I'm just reading on some of my uh, chat streams here. People are saying, oh, I love that Viva went from being mild-mannered to mad as hell. I'm not going to take it anymore. What happened to you? It's been a slow transition, as people can see from the thumbnail. That was me when I ran for office back in Canada, August 2021. I said I was going to grow the hair until we had freedom, and uh, the hair is still growing. But yeah, once upon a time, reluctant to share my opinions. Uh, I think we've entered a realm now where people have an obligation to share their opinions and just make sure that they're reasonably well-founded. And you're an attorney. And what has happened in Canada as it pertains to people's ability to express themselves? Uh, I'm an attorney by trade, so sworn in in 2007. And I, and I, you know, I was a decent attorney. I used to work for one of the largest law firms in Canada. Uh, left after my first kid started on my own had something of a midlife crisis, thought I was going to go study commercial photography, but then ended up opening up my own solo practice, turned it into a boutique litigation. So I actually have 13 years of practice under my belt. What's happened in Canada? It, the slippery slope fallacy is not a fallacy. It's a strategy. And you get to a slippery slope until you fall right off the cliff. Um, it's, it's basically full censorship in Canada. We're going to talk about, you know, the government prioritizing the interests of children, notwithstanding parental consent. I had a couple of red lines or lines in the sand that I said, if this happens in Canada, that's going to be my red line or my line in the sand. One of them was, it's not very well known, a bill called Bill 15 out of Quebec, which revamped the Youth Protection Act and eliminated parental supremacy as the guiding principle and added or changed it for the child's best interest, as determined by the courts, which basically means now the courts, the administrative system, determines the child's best interest over the parents, which is going to segue us into mm -hmm. this. But Canada, censorship, Bill C-11, Online Streaming Act, Justin Trudeau wants to basically turn Canada into a hermit nation in the absence of a war, just do it through legislation. And he's really well on his way to doing it. What, what, what is the plan? Where are they going with this? What, what is the utopia that they imagine? 
the utopia and having now come to America, if only temporarily, is that, you know, a, a, a government run state is, is basically the government is your daddy now. Justin Trudeau, as he says time and time again, his number one goal is to keep Canadians safe. And uh, that's the government's role. So we got to keep you so safe. We take away all of your risky freedoms. They want to stay in power. They want to suppress people's ability to call out their corruption because I, I, I do refer to Trudeau as a regime now. The Trudeau regime has gone through one scandal after another, meaningful scandals. Like Justin Trudeau has twice been found to be in violation of a federal law on ethics, um, two ethics breaches. He had three accusations. He's been accused of groping a reporter back in 2000. He apologized for that incident. Um, two ethics violations, one for taking what's effectively bribes from uh, uh, the Aga Khan who is petitioning the federal government for federal aid, not federal aid, federal funds, while giving Justin Trudeau all expense paid vacations to his private island. Trudeau doesn't declare it. Ethics violation number one. Ethics violation number two, uh, putting pressure on the Minister of Justice and Attorney General not to prosecute his pals at SNC-Lavalin, this international construction conglomerate. Uh, he faced the third ethics charge for not um, allowing his mother and his wife and brother, basically to take um, payments for speaking fees as relates to his mother and brother from a charity that got a sole source government contract from the government to manage a billion dollars. It's one scandal after another. And the easiest way to battle scandal, to shut people up, to control the internet, to control disinformation. And uh, what they're trying to do now in Canada with this thing called Bill C-11, the online streaming network is govern online content creators the way the government regulates and governs radio and television. Uh, create these onerous obligations of Canadian content, CanCon. It's endless. It, it, it begs the question, what, what's wrong with the Canadian people? And, and why, why does he find any enthusiastic participants in, in this process? It's a tough question to answer. Now that I've run for federal office, I can tell you, it's not enthusiastic support anymore. It's almost reluctant, uh, what do they call pinching your nose and, and, and voting support? Much like uh, in the States, mm -hmm. you had people saying, well, I, I hate Hillary Clinton, but I'm just going to block my nose and vote for her anyhow because Donald Trump is worse. Um, and, and I'll yeah. say this, I, I've said it on my channel. I, 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 I recall having voted for Trudeau in 2015, but I was an idiot. Like I was an, an ignorant, naive idiot who thought if you voted liberal, it meant you're liberal and it meant you're a good person. And there's still a lot of people who are under that frame of mind. Monday, now they think, August, <laughs> that's Sorry. not my phone, people. <laughs> but now, I know, but people get through it even when I put do not disturb up. <laughs> so go ahead. I put, I put mine on do not disturb. But uh, no, there's people who are under that impression now. They think, hey, if I vote liberal, it makes me liberal, even though Justin Trudeau is one notch um, less tyrannical than President Xi out of China. And he's, he's, he's turned Canada into a hermit kingdom uh, of, of the Western world. And, and he's done it through legislation. What do you mean hermit? What does and, that mean? Well, they're what basically mean, like, shut, kingdom? It's, what is it? it's gonna effectively try to shut out the rest of, shut down Canadians from being able to express themselves. We're not there yet, but uh, exclude them from the rest of the Western world. If this Bill C-11 passes, what it would effectively do is uh, stifle any, Canadian content um, from streaming online freely. It would impose Canadian content, which is nothing more than government regulated content on independent creators. Uh, it would slap the label of misinformation on content creators. It would demote through the algorithm creators that are deemed to be, um, you know, misinformation, disinformation of which, as far as I'm concerned, the government subsidized media in Canada is that by definition. And so effectively, when I say, you know, when I say he's going to turn Canada into a hermit kingdom, it's going to turn it into the basic dictatorship of China, but peacefully through legislation, and the people will have willingly voted their way into it and allowed the laws to be passed into it. He, I, I saw what happened over the years to Jordan Peterson, and, and he was, he sort of saw this coming and was objecting on the basis of the kinds of issues that you were raising here. And it's just so odd to me that so many of these Western countries are going through this virtually this same phenomenon with 
really very different histories and very different forces. You know, we have racism and racialization of our society here that is used as the, you know, one of the main sort of motivators for people. You don't have that and you have a different history, very different history, and yet you're ending up in the same place where, where all our governments are sort of doing, is there something about technology or about the public mind or something that's just moving things in that direction that we aren't particularly conscious of? Well, what's interesting is you say that we don't have the same history of racialization in, in, in Canada. Uh, I mean, I'd say that it's arguable to some extent, but what's clear is that we are following the same political divide and conquer that we saw under Obama in America. I mean, I'm old enough now to have remembered a time when we didn't have constant um, racial discussions. We didn't constantly have divide and conquer along racious, or, or, or racial, ethnic, religious sexual orientation lines. It was a phenomenon that started, um, I'd say contemporaneously with, with um, started earlier with Obama, but Justin Trudeau has, has brought that to Canada um, on steroids. And all discussion now in Canada is, is brought through this, these blinders of racial, ethnic, religious, gender identity blinders or, 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 or you know, goggles. It, 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 I, you know, I'm, I'm no expert on Canada, but it has always seemed to me that some of the excesses in Canada have come in through the French heritage. Uh, and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's sort of been my impression. And I understand you were silenced or you were somehow uh, censored in France and you have a workaround for that that you were going to share with us, but something happened to you in France. But I, I wanted to bring up France and the French because I have noticed that young people in French, and I, I think, again, I don't live there and I don't have regular contact with France, but when I was there not that long ago, the French youth are starting to rise up to restore the idea of liberté in the basic guiding principles of this republic that was founded on three things, liberty being one of them. Uh, they were, when, when we were there, it was largely around vaccine mandates. So like they were saying, hey, you told me this thing isn't gonna hurt me really, and you're gonna force me to put something in my body? The government's gonna force me? No, I'm in the street. Is there something, are they a little ahead of the curve there? Did that settle down? Is something like that gonna happen in Canada? Does does France inspire Canada anyway? Sort of a lot of questions embedded in that, but go ahead. Well, okay, big distinction one has to make between French from France and French from Quebec. And just, th this will be um, very interesting for the audience. Um, out of France, from, you know, with the deep French European accent, um, all swear words relate to, or, or the big swear words relate to uh, sexuality. You say putain is like, is slut, uh, putes is a whore. All of these French classic swear words are all based on Merdique. sexuality in Quebec. Merd Merdique, no, in, Merdique. Now that's, that's Quebec. <laughs> now in Quebec, all swear words are based on religion. Merde uh, is, well, that's just shit, mm. but... Um, uh, Colis is the is the wafer uh, sacrifice. Like all of these swear words in Quebec are based on religion. So there is a big cultural difference between France French and Quebec French. And you know, I'd say the one um, I don't think for anything any um, what did you, what was the word you used extremist uh, extreme elements you know made it into Canada via the French. What the French in Quebec and in Canada excesses, have a history excesses. of excesses excesses is word. Yes, excesses. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put words in your mouth at all. <laughs> no, what what the French in Quebec historically have been known for is fighting, resisting, and, you know, being la resistance, preserving the French culture, the French identity in Quebec, which is why yes. a lot of people yeah. in the States who look up in Quebec and say, what happened where you had this French rebellion culture that preserved their identity against, you know, English, uh, English culture, English domination, all of a sudden willingly relinquished all of their most fundamental rights and liberties to the individual I call the sunset thief dictator, Francois Legault, who's the premier of Quebec, who locked us in our houses for five and a half months in 2021 under curfew to fight the virus. We in the province of Quebec, the rebellious French spirit, basically just lay down and gave the government all of their rights. Nobody could understand it and I can't understand it because you have a French identity in the province that wants to preserve their identity, that are uh, historically have been a rebellious in a good way culture. Now, contrary to what you see in France, 
hey, we, we like it, Monsieur Legault. We reelected Monsieur Legault. We gave him more seats in government despite three years of tyrannical abuse and desecration of our most fundamental rights and liberties. France, in France, have always been a very uh, prone to protest. I, I lived in France in 99 to 2000 when I was studying philosophy at La Sorbonne. Only on the weekends. Every set, I used to live on Boulevard Saint Michel, it's Boule Mich. <laughs> That's where the protests really? went through. Yeah, every Saturday. Yeah, always. But Quebec, yeah, Quebec, only on were, Saturday, were, though. It's very strange. I found, I've, I found that strange. It was always Saturday night when the cops just lined up and waited for the for, for the was, uh, protest. It was like, like clockwork, but in Quebec, I was out there protesting the vaccine passports, I was out there protesting the COVID measures, and we were being demonized by not just Canadian English media, but by French media as well. So it, I don't know when the reversal happened. It's like people think that they are going to, um, they're going to relinquish their way into guaranteed paradise security when we have abandoned everything under the false pretext that the government can keep us safe, when the government can't even keep the hospitals running properly. Yeah, yeah, that, that whole notion of safety Uber Alice, I, I it's just, it's, sort of incomprehensible to me and that 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 preoccupation with safety overall would be something that they would entrust the, a government with is there anything but, but, the government does well or better than anybody else <laughs> anything the answer the answer is yes they waste taxpayers money a lot better and then they give themselves yes. more work to look into it afterwards quebec i mean just everybody knows this but people have forgotten it we had hospitals reaching capacity Uber Alice, above everything else, beautiful. We, we had hospitals in Canada and Quebec having to post, well, it was in Ontario, having to postpone elective surgeries before COVID because they were overwhelmed. In Quebec, the wait time now to get a GP is like, I, I forget what it is, like a year. Yeah. It's close to a year. Uh, the government yes. has failed yeah, the, miserably. Listen, the, the way, listen, Viva, the way, the way this country looks at the Canadian healthcare system reminds me of the way they used to look at Russia and the Ukraine around 1946 or so. There's, oh, this wonderful, everything is great, while people starve to death. I guess we're actually more in the 20s. But anyway, let's let's take a quick break. I, I, I want to bring my cohort, Dr. Kelly Victory, in here as quickly as possible. This has been fun. We're going to keep it going. Uh, we're watching you on the restream. We are also out on Twitter spaces. I'm not sure we're going to have a chance for calls today, but I, I, I beg your pardon if, if not, but we'll see what I can get to. And of course, we are over on Rumble. We'll look for us there. Be right back. I think you know how much Susan and I love our Genucel skincare and how easy it is to try our one of a kind customer packages bundled with our favorite products. Susan realized the other day that one of our kids stole some of our deep correcting serum from our stash, if you will. We had no idea that the lactic and hyaluronic acid combo is so great for adult acne, dark marks, and scars so not only are susan and i hooked on these products but apparently somebody else in our family is too somebody's ripping it off i know i'm a snob about the products i use on my face everybody knows it every time i go to the dermatologist's office they're just rows and rows of different creams retinols vitamin c cream under eye cream night creams scrubs and then when I get to the counter, they're overpriced. All kinds of products that you can all find at Genucel.com. I've fallen in love with this product at a fraction of the price. I've been using Genucel for six months now, and I'm very impressed. Great skincare is important at any age, and we love how amazing the results are. Thank you to Genucel. Plus, now you can find your very own bundle based on your unique skincare needs using cutting-edge AI skincare technology. You can get a full skin analysis instantly and create a skincare regimen tailored towards your needs. Visit genucel.com slash Drew to check out our favorites and enter that promo code Drew, D-R-E-W, at checkout for added savings. All orders include free shipping and a free mineral mask. Order now. Go to genucel.com slash Drew. That is genucel, G-E-N-U-C-E-L, genucel.com slash Drew. Despite the U.S. blowing through the $31.4 trillion debt ceiling this January, the White House and the government still refuses to reduce spending. When it comes to fiscal responsibility, you can't afford to bury your head in the sand. Now would be a great time to consider gold with Birch Gold. In times of high uncertainty and instability, gold is king. Birch Gold makes it easy to convert an IRA or 401k into an IRA in precious metals. Here's what you need to do. Visit birchgold.com slash Drew to claim your free information kit, the info kit on gold, and then talk to one of their precious metals specialists. Think about this. 
to dig our country out of this mountain of debt, every single taxpayer in the country would have to write a check for $247,000. And, of course, they're not, so it's only getting worse. Protect yourself with gold today by visiting birchgold.com slash Drew. That is B-I-R-C-H gold.com slash Drew. With an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, thousands of happy customers, and countless five-star reviews, you can trust Birch Gold to protect your future. Here's what I want you to do. Visit birchgold.com slash true today. Some platforms have banned the discussion of controversial topics. If this episode ends here, the rest of the show is available at drdrew.tv. There's nothing in medicine that doesn't boil down to a risk-benefit calculation. It is the mandate public health to consider the impact of any particular mitigation scheme on the entire population. This is uncharted territory, Drew. Welcome, Dr. Kelly Victory. And Kelly, we we glanced past the topic of uh, parental rights and euthanasia, but uh, I'll hand off to you here. Well, first of all, thanks so much for joining us, David. There are just uh, many, many ways to take this discussion. I, I don't want to jump ahead, Drew, before I at least comment on uh, what you guys were talking about. I'll tell you right now, you cannot get people to give up their their liberties without the government or the people who are trying to do so optimizing, maximizing, and leveraging fear. It's all about fear. Mm. When people are in a place of fear, which happens every time, whether it's that they um, plant a, a irrational fear of a group, whether it's you know African Americans or Jews or I illegal immigrants, whatever it is, or whether they create an unrealistic and irrational, unscientific fear of a virus, they have to do that first. And then in that place of fear, people make very, very poor decisions. If you were ever a reader of Dune, Frank Herbert, you know, said, you know, I shall not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. Yeah. And it does because you make really, really bad decisions. Careful. And uh, I've said Le, before, Le, Le Petit Moore has totally different re, uh, translation in the Viva Fry's uh, Quebecois. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say, you know, and I've made the analogy, David, uh, that what happened during this pandemic is unlike anything I've ever seen, where huge groups of people looked at the mandates, whether it was a mask mandate or a vaccine mandate, and it became like swaddling. Uh, you have kids that, you know, if you take a baby and you wrap it up tightly, it loses all control, all autonomy over its own limbs but somehow feel safe and secure in that chrysalis. Mm. And that mm -hmm. is what's happened, I think, during this pandemic. You talk about the fear. It, it, it was fear porn. I mean, it's the same in the States, but in Canada, we, don't, we didn't even have the benefit of a Fox News, although Fox News is arguably better in some respects <laughs> than the other. In Canada, you know, we have, we have uh, CBC News, and then the rest are, if they're not directly subsidized by the, by the government, which CBC News is, they're indirectly subsidized and they were running mm -hmm. irrational, endless fear right. porn. They were running ads on daytime radio about wearing a mask, all this stuff. It was day in and day out. They shut down mm -hmm. stores it, it, in the pharmacies. And you as doctors will love this. When the non-essential businesses were shut down and essential businesses were allowed to remain open, essential businesses could not sell non-essential products. So they literally saran wrapped off certain sections of the stores. Right. So you couldn't buy, for example, birthday cards, but you could buy batteries. Or in fact, batteries were locked off at one place. But it was just endless psychological terror mm -hmm. day in and day mm -hmm. out. And people came to the point where, yeah, and I just want my life back. Well, I, I try not to judge because I might have been irrationally mm -hmm. fearful for about two weeks. But when I saw that they were padlocking mm -hmm. clothes, the outdoor dog runs, even this idiot lawyer knew something is not right. And yeah, started questioning. Right. So no, so it really is. It's really predicated on that fear factor, on leveraging fear and making irrational fear because then people become so miserable that they finally get to the point where they say, I will do anything you ask if you just make it stop. Just make it stop, please. Mm. Uh, and we ended, we've ended up with an entire culture now that is happily wrapped in swaddling. They have given over their own civil liberties and control of their lives and their livelihoods to a government. And God help you try to get it back. It won't come back. So uh, mm. we're we're in a we're in God. a 
a, a real bind here. But um, so it's all about fear. Um, it, I do want to talk with you about this issue. The, the the topic supposedly for this show, although we could take it any direction, is this outrageous um, uh, I don't even know what to call it, report of the Canadian health ministry considering subjugating parents' uh, involvement in the decision of a child uh, to decide to uh, participate in assisted suicide in an assisted death. Um, talk about that, where, where that is, how that came, even came across your radar. Well, they, they call them mature minors, uh, uh, which is just fantastic. <laughs> okay. now, so I, I, I read that report in, uh, in Fox News. <laughs> Oh, no, well, you know, oh, we'll get to euphemisms in a second, but yeah, no, mature minors. But um, so I read that article in Fox News the other day as well. I, I, it's, I'm once bitten, twice shy, and I'm even reluctant to believe some of the stuff at its on its face that even though I want to believe it, I say like, geez, it's not conceivable to me that they would be discussing allowing minors to elect for medical assistance in dying. They call it maids because apparently mm -hmm. euthanasia is too loaded a term. <laughs> and the amazing thing is, Previous regimes have had their euphemisms for state-sanctioned ending of life. Uh, well, at one point, it was called mercy killings, where they were, in fact, euthanizing the mentally ill, the mentally incapable. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have gone right back to that in Canada. So much so that I forget what the journal was. It was a journal saying Justin Trudeau's euthanasia policies in Canada uh, echo of Nazi Germany uh, mercy killings, because it started off with the Supreme Court decision saying, uh, preventing people from ending their own lives is unconstitutional. It then began with legislation proposed by the Liberal government to allow for it. It then allow it then it then went to certain uh, Liberal ministers proposing that well we don't want to um, discriminate against the mentally ill we have to allow them in as much as they can consent to ending their lives despite mental illness to do that. They had a sunset clause which said after a few years. Uh, the exclusion of mentally ill from availing themselves of medical assistance in dying will sunset. And now they're seriously, apparently, discussing allowing minors to do it and allowing minors to do it, notwithstanding parental opposition, because mature minors can now do things on their own. And this was my line in the sand in Quebec with that Bill C, uh, it was not Bill C, Bill 15, which removed parental supremacy from the Youth Protection Act. And I said, like, like Jordan Peterson was sounding the bell on Bill C-16 back in 2016, that was adding gender identity as aggravating factors to certain types of hate crimes or certain types of crimes to make them hate crimes. Uh, uh, Jordan Peterson said, this is going to result in compelled speech. I was keeping my opinion to myself back in the day, no more. This, this Bill 15 in Quebec, I said, which removes parental supremacy as the guiding overarching factor in youth protection laws, it's only going to end with mm. children asking, you know, demanding vaccination, children demanding gender affirming care or, you know, genital mutilation, depending on how you perceive it, notwithstanding parental objection, where the government makes that decision, because it doesn't put the interest of the child as the number as the overarching factor. It puts the authorization of the state, these administ administrative tribunals over the interest of the child or to ratify the interest of the child if it's aligned. And now there's discussion, apparently, about allowing minors to end their own lives, mature minors, notwithstanding parental opposition, they have this, this committee, they say, okay, we should hear what the parents have to say, but if the child's sufficiently mature a minor, they can make the decision, notwithstanding what their parents object to ending the life. And I mean, I'm not even convinced that it's only limited to um, you know, deadly, no, no, no prospect of life illnesses, as with adults right now. Um, it's not terminal illness, it's just you know, uh, there's certain criteria and they want to allow the mentally ill adults to consent to the ultimate, the ultimate consequence, uh, whereas typically as a lawyer in law, mental illness vitiates consent. And now it seems that they're right. even pushing the envelope of minors. So there are two there are two sort of ways that I think this is problematic. Number one, it really we can talk about what is it's a consummate slippery slope. We have eroded the sanctity of life and it's been going on for a long time. Um, I happen to be a proponent, by the way, of uh, assisted suicide in certain cases. I think it's the merciful me thing to do. Me and too. we can talk about that. Yes, um, I've been participant in that yeah. as a physician, um, uh, but it should be taken you know, under very serious, serious consideration. Then there's the whole issue of, of allowing children 
to do this. Before I was a physician, I was I was a an adolescent psychologist before I was a physician. Uh, that was my first degree, uh, and I worked in a maximum security juvenile correctional facility. I can tell you that regardless of which school of of the great schools of psychology that you choose to follow, I don't care if you're talking Freud, Jung, Skinner, Erickson, Piaget, whomever. They all agree on one thing. They all agreed on one thing, which is that adolescence is a time that is marked by uh, impulsivity, uh, egocentric Turmoil. thoughts, emotional lability, mm-hmm. uh, and, in, and a non-concrete mm-hmm. and non-well-determined uh, self-identity. It's why kids have purple hair one day and you know and blonde you know per- perm the next. It's why they try on lots of different identities. The idea of you know, and it's also by the way why we don't let them vote, uh, buy a firearm, get married, join the military. You know, uh, lots of other things that we don't let them do because of this. Um, um, this impulsivity. So the idea that we would allow them to make fundamentally life-changing, irreversible decisions, uh, whether it's a gender issue or a vaccination issue, or God forbid, uh, participating uh, in, in in assisted suicide or as you know, death with dignity, is just. I mean, it's, it's the definition yeah. of insanity. Kelly, the way I always said that is that uh, adolescents need an adult functioning prefrontal cortex superimposed on there right. that is not functioning until the age of 25 or so. But, uh, right. it, you know, it's interesting to me that that most of the um, most of the critics of euthanasia in this country always go to an argument about physician excess, how physicians will run amok, how the medical caretakers mm-hmm. will end up killing people just at whim. It's, that's their fantasy. And yet, isn't it just so odd that here's an entire country going, yeah, we don't want those doctors that are trained to make these decisions do it. We want the government to do it. We want bureaucrats to do this. That's who we want to give our our most sacred privileges and freedoms to. It's bizarre. It is bizarre. What is happening up there? Well, here, you guys are both doctors, so you put it like in frontal cortex and brain development. I just say kids are idiots. Like I, I was a kid. I was an idiot. We used to jump off garages. I used to make smoke bombs for Halloween. One, one time they exploded in the kitchen while I was making them and I nearly burnt the house down. Kids are idiots. There's a reason why you don't let them make adult decisions. There's a reason why you don't let them get tattoos. Um, that's not to say that they can't, under certain circumstances, know what they think they need at the time. But, um, but, but Dr. Drew, like... It's the, the, the retort to what you just said is, well, you know, doctors at the end of the day are going to have to sign off on this. So we're not just leaving it to the, to the uh, you, know, it, you know, the powers of the government. Some professional down the line has to sign off on it. We are witnessing real-time abuses today in Canada. There, there, there was a woman who was euthanized, I'm not medical. She was killed. She, her life was taken by the government because they approved her death. She had multiple chemical sensitivities, and her issue was that she couldn't find adequate lodging. To, to, to meet her needs. The government has a financial interest in approving these uh, assisted suicides because it saves them money. They even ran some reports that said, don't worry, it's not going to cost you money. It might actually save you money. And I don't know if, I, I presume both of you know the stats. 2021, 10,064 Canadians were euthanized in Canada. That represents over 3% of all death in Canada wow. was imposed or sanctioned by the government, by the state. And it's, it's, it's only going to get worse in 2022. I'm having a running poll on, on my channel to see what it's going to be. It's the definition of insidious corruption when the government that is approving the ultimate sanction or the ultimate decision has a vested financial economic interest in opera. There are emergency rooms are already overloaded. People are literally dying in waiting rooms in Nova Scotia across the country. They can't handle the system they currently have. And so they're massively expanding euthanasia. And it's not only being applied to people who are terminally ill, it's being applied to people with illnesses that make life uncomfortable because the government can't treat them properly in life. It's it's an absolute atrocity. There's no other word for it. And ever since my brother made me aware of this this summer, uh, 2022, where I couldn't even believe the numbers he was giving me, I have now decided to eliminate the filter and let the world know what I think of this. Well, you're absolutely right. We have seen an unprecedented abuse of the system during this pandemic. I mean, he, he, here's the reality. Uh, if you think that the system is out to protect you or, or look out for your best needs, you only have to look at what they have done to people. They implemented things that they knew didn't work. 
anybody who acts as mm -hmm. if, well, they made the best decisions they could because they, 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 with the information they had at the time, bullshit. We've known for decades that masks didn't work. We've known for decades that lockdowns cause more harm than good. We've known social distancing was a made up construct. Uh, we knew that closing schools would exact a huge toll on groups of people who are at essentially no risk and on and on. So these are the same people who you entrusted, who have ruined the last three years of your life, destroyed our economies, destroyed the education of children. Uh, and, and now these same people we're supposed to trust are going to make you know, the decision to help you make the best decision about ending your life. I don't think so. Hmm. And hmm. some cases, hmm. other cases, there was a veteran who called up Veteran Affairs in, in, uh, in Canada because he suffers from PTSD and they recommended medical assistance in dying. And when that went public, they, you know, the government said, oh, that's terrible. We apologize for that. I have had people consult with me privately. I'm trying, you know, I'll, I'll wait for them to be comfortable enough to go public. People who just are being encouraged to end their lives because the, mm -hmm. the government bureaucrat working the other end is trying to make them understand what a burden and drain on society they are. It's not normal that you can go from 5,000 to 10,000 euthanized deaths in three years, and it's going to be exponentially higher this year unless, I, unless my you know, estimations are off. It's not normal. And um, it's, the most, it's, the most inhumane, um, it's the most inhumane thing we can possibly imagine, but they cloak it in benevolence and they say, oh, you, 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 Viva, you're against um, medical assistance. And I, say, I am not. When someone is terminally ill, I've seen the ravages of, of terminal cancer and I understand it. And people should be allowed to end their lives with dignity when all that they have to look forward to is more suffering of an incurable disease. But they're administering it to people who are not permanently ill by any means and who are actually only choosing this because the, this is the more um, pleasant alternative than living in, in a system that can't take care of them while we, you know, continue see, to... Yeah. Well, they would always have you, have you believe that it's either that it's black or white. Either you are pro assisted suicide or or medically assisted death or you are totally against it that there's no room in between in the same way that he would say either you are pro abortion and that means you 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 have to support the idea of having an abortion up to 9 months up to the time of delivery or you're you know against it uh, they, they will not look at some you say that yes there is an absolute place as i said i strongly support medically assisted death. Uh, and as I said, I've participated in many over the years. Um, but there, the idea of allowing, as you said, kids to do it without the support of their parents or not in the cases of terminal uh, debilitating illness, those sorts of things. Uh, you know, once you start doing that, just like I have said, once you have these late term year uh, allowing abortions up to the time of delivery, and I don't know where it stands in Canada, um, but once we have started allowing that in the United States, there is no daylight, as far as I'm concerned, between us and the CCP or North Korea or other, uh, the few limited areas in the world where you're still allowed allowed to do this atrocity. Dr. Drew, Dr. Victory, I don't know if you have a, someone can fact check me in real time, but um, I'm fairly, I'm 99% certain Canada is the only, na the only nation in the world Go with ahead. no criminal prohibitions on abortion. Now it just happens as a matter of fact, they don't carry them out after I think I want to say 24 weeks, but I'm not sure. That might be a little low. Oh. But Canada, I'm fairly certain, the only country with no criminal prohibitions. There was a story of a very radical case of a late-term abortion recently out of Quebec. But, um, but there is an unwritten rule among doctors that they won't do it after a certain point. But now that you mention that, you know, the abortion, the abortion side of things in terms of perspective, the corruption that can occur where there's a vested interest, I don't know in right. organ donation. I, now I'm, I'm, right. I'm hypothesizing, but I've seen how dark the government does get with the, yeah. with the board and fetal tissue. You think that, that there's not gonna be a market for that for euthanasia? So in addition to saving the system money, in addition to people in real time being egged on into ending their own lives because the government bureaucrat working the other end says, you're a burden, you're in misery, it's never gonna get any better for you because we just don't have the resources. Well, now there might be a financial interest to, to encourage them to mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. On the organ harvesting side, it's an endless black hole it doesn't, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a bottomless uh, pit of depravity. There's no other way to describe it. Ugh.
Disgusting. No, I agree. Well, I agree. And it really gets back to, um, it, we talk about this, Drew and I do all the time. When I was training, physicians were largely independent. Now, the vast majority of physicians in the United States are, you know, belong to a corporation. You're an employee. You're an employee of a large corporation, and that corporation pulls all the strings. So you're absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. There are financial incentives to do lots of things. Uh, we certainly saw it during COVID. Again, uh, there were huge financial financial incentives to, uh, to admit people to the hospital with a diagnosis of COVID, uh, to put them on ventilators, to withhold treatment with certain things and to push other things. You certainly couldn't give ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine or any of the uh, inexpensive, readily available medications. You had to use the new ones, you know, remdesivir and, and then ultimately Paxlovid um, it, for the same reason. There are huge financial incentives to do that. And I expect that in Canada, given that your system uh, is more socialized than ours, I, Ours is quickly going there. Uh, truly, there's even a, a bigger incentive, I would say, in Canada. In Canada, we're dealing with the licensure problems. We're like doctors who were actually giving religious exemptions for uh, for the jab. Uh, we're getting reprimanded. We're getting, we're, you know, they had their licenses, uh, I think, taken away under certain circumstances or in certain cases. So th there's that pressure where, um, you know, doctors like lawyers now, they're independent art of the practice has been subordinated to the licensing bodies that, you know, for lawyers, make sure that they, or try to pressure them to adhere to certain diversity, inclusion, and equity uh, principles. As far as the medical practice goes, that's been the big, the big uh, hurdle there, or the big pressure there, is complaints. Uh, for, I, I, I spoke with a doctor who was facing, basically, I mean, having their practice destroyed because they were issuing med religious exemptions and medical exemptions of the jab, and uh, the licensing body didn't like that. So that, that is the corruption, at least in Canada. One of the things we're facing, facing here in the United States, and I don't, uh, is we are looking at uh, President Biden signing uh, this treaty with the World Health Organization that would abdicate uh, essentially sovereignty over the U.S. Constitution to the World Health Organization in a time of crisis. Uh, very loosely defined, by the way, not necessarily an actual crisis, but a potential crisis that it would allow the World Health Organization essentially to be the controlling body. They would supersede our constitution, be able to mandate everything from medications to where you could travel, vaccines, all kinds of things. Um, so I, we're in your estimation, you know, you're watching this here from the United States, you know, I, I don't know what will happen in Canada, but it looks to me like we are very, very close to codifying uh, those amendments to that treaty and turning over um, our, our ultimate control of our future to the World Health Organization. So I actually, we discussed this, if it wasn't last Sunday, it was the Sunday before with Robert Barnes, who's my American counterpart attorney. Um, and so the, his opinion on this or the consensus is that the risk is there but it's not as easy. It, do, it doesn't just get put into law by way of executive order. It has to go through uh, Congress and the Senate. It has to be ratified like a treaty is ratified to make it law. So it's not there yet. But as we discussed it, as I, as I remarked, it doesn't need to get to a treaty when you have private corporations basically implementing the policy for and on behalf of the government. So it's all fine and games. You know, they won't ratify the treaty as to unvaccinated people not being able to go certain places, but you'll just have private enterprise, you know, acting right. on their own, implementing these policies. So the government gets private actors to do what would be more difficult for them to do politically or legally. And we're, that's, what's, that's what's effectively happening. What has to happen well, here, and hopefully we're going to get there, is private enterprises get sued for the consequences of what they're doing and then are maybe a little more reluctant to act like the government lapdogs and not the government uh, or independent bodies, I should say. No, you're exactly right. That is what happened with COVID. We had, we had them saying, oh, we're not saying that there's, a, you know, the CDC isn't mandating masks. It's just that, you know, United Airlines does and, and every grocery store does and they get the right. private and, enterprise. And, and look, well, and that's and what they did. Get into, Go ahead. We're going to get into that with vaccines too, right? The, the CDC only recommends childhood vaccines and the schools then mandate it because the CDC recommends right. it. I, I, I want to ask a quick question, which is, well, it may not be so quick. The, again, I, I, Kelly knows, and I've already been, you know, in this sort of confused state with you repeatedly, which is, you know, what's happening? What is going on with us? <laughs> One of the most striking uh, findings for me 
in some of the in, inexplicable behavior of our leaders, in particular our scientific leaders, was how they were so thoroughly hoodwinked by their Chinese Communist Party cohorts in China. The scientists over there were the ones that convinced our people that lockdown was the way of the world, thus they at the Lord was a fantastic technique. And uh, how we fell for that, I, I have no idea. But I'm also noticing that you have been uh, worried about the, some cozy relationships between the liberal party and the ch perhaps some Chinese financial influence. Uh, I, I, is this, is, when I ask you things like, how is the whole world doing, how does this happen? The whole world goes this one direction. Is it possible that uh, we're seeing some undue influence by some force out there that is you know, really being brilliantly having its way? Dr. Drew, how much how much pressure does a politician need to seize more power? I mean, yeah, I, I'm asking it's it's sort of tongue in cheek. You know, the West didn't need the Western politicians didn't need to get nudged too hard to fall into full tyrannical mode because if they had all the power, they would look for any excuse to do it under ordinary circumstances. Given given the excuse, mm -hmm. and they'll jump all over it. Um, sorry, but uh, to say the infiltration in Canada. Not that it's it, it's there. There was a CSIS report. It's the Canadian Security and Intelligence something, which has now determined, or at least raised the risk, that there has been Chinese financial um, interference with federal politics by way of supporting or helping elect uh, members of the Liberal government. Okay, uh, financial uh, meddling is one thing, but when you have a prime minister who says that he admires the basic dictatorship of China, it doesn't take that much nudging. They're looking for the excuse and they have a system and they have a method of getting it implemented. They own the government, does owns he? the media. He, well, he, he owns the media uh, directly with but the No, uh, but CDC does he government. does he admire Xi's government? Hell yeah. Oh, Justin Trudeau? Uh, he 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 yeah. loves them. He was understating it. He loves it. He implements it. He wants more. He wants that here. He wants absolute control because he's the benevolent dictator mm -hmm. who, uh, there you go. He's the benevolent dictator who knows what's best for you and he knows how to keep you safe. Uh, so he didn't need much of a, of a nudge or you know, pressure from China. Uh, this is a group think uh, among politicians. They want to control every aspect of citizen life. They will, they'll strip the citizens of all of their rights in order to have the total power to keep them safe, except they just can't do it because they're incapable, they're incompetent and they're corrupt. But uh, no, the CSIS report is, is amazing. Like uh, this, it's, it's, it unfortunately came out the week after Commissioner Rouleau exonerated Justin Trudeau for his, uh, you know, dictatorial fist of fury suppression of the Ottawa protest, a violent suppression of the most peaceful protest. The government investigated itself and concluded no wrongdoing. Uh, but yeah, they, they, you know, mm, the Western shocking. politicians, power hungry, uh, you know, petty tyrants didn't need much of a nudge. They saw the opportunity, they seized it, and they, they hoodwinked the general population into going along with it voluntarily. Well, if you add that, if you, if you add on to that, the infiltration of the Chinese Communist Party into our academic institutions, I think you really mm. have the, the perfect storm. Um, you know that we have huge, huge influence um, in our scientific laboratories and our scientific uh, academic institutions from the CCP. Uh, they've funded tremendous amounts of research here. And, you know, the DOJ has been looking into that in the U.S. for a long time. But it's not just in our scientific labs. It's really all over. If you look at the investments of the CCP into our larger universities, uh, and then on top of it, if you look at the investments made by different federal institutions like the Department of Health and Human Services to our academic institutions, it's all one big, you know, corrupt uh, cesspool. Uh, you know, I just saw the Yale uh, is taking over $600 million a year in HHS grant funding. Okay. What do you think is going to come out of, of Yale's, you know, in, in terms of scientific studies? It's going to be exactly what HHS wants them to produce or the Chinese Communist Party wants them to produce. Uh, I mean, it is really so corrupt. I don't have kids, but if I did, I certainly... Uh, would not be sending them off to university because you, you might as well send them directly to Beijing. Can, can you imagine, by the way, that early on in the pandemic, The Lancet, I think it was, uh, I mean, it was, it was early on into the pandemic, The Lancet published, uh, it was an op-ed or signed by a bunch of doctors, that it was racist to suggest 
that the virus originated in a lab in Wuhan, China, <laughs> and that and yeah, that's my favorite. Oh, no, but, and then 18 yeah. months later, they write another piece that says it's always been a perfectly plausible explanation. I I don't know what what accounts for the um, infiltration or rather just the, the this uh, what accounts for what's been going on, but it's been going on, uh, you know, in a, in a big way. And uh, I mean, we're, we're seeing we're seeing the, the effects of it right now where you can't hide the truth forever. And then when it, when the truth comes out, you have to like it has to come out slowly so that people don't get too enraged and they forgot how they got duped. But yeah, there's a heavy, heavy influence and suppression of inf information under the guise of disinformation. Uh, right. Viva Living, and, and, I want to point out, you, though, the 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 I want to point out the uh, the the uh, the racist comments about saying the virus came from China. The, the the real comedy embedded in that is that it's racist to say that they had a level three highly sophisticated viral lab studying coronaviruses, but it is not racist to say the Chinese people are gross and they go to, to wet markets and eat animals and bats and pangolins. That's not racist, but it's racist to say they have a, a very high level, highly secure coronavirus lab in Wuhan. Dr. No, Drew, no, my, I mean, my Oh, go, go I was going to say my, my favorite my, my my favorite was that it's racist to call it the Wuhan flu, but it's not racist to call it West Nile virus, dengue fever, <laughs> Middle Eastern <laughs> respiratory <laughs> stress syndrome, uh, you know, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Lyme disease, and on yeah. and on. We have you a long it. and storied history yeah. of naming diseases after where the area from whence they came. I'm sorry, David. Go and, ahead. But go no, ahead. And I'm going to say, and, and in Canada, Justin Trudeau is suggesting it's racist to say that the Chinese government might have infiltrated or influenced the elections. Because because one of his Chinese members of, 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 of parliament or members of the cabinet might have been one of the objects of the beneficial treatment or the, or the funding. All that I know now for the last three years, when someone says that's racist, you can't say that, you know damn well that you're on to something of the truth, if not the truth itself, because it's the, it's the victimization way of concealing the truth. Uh, in as much as when someone says it's for the children, it's the hiding behind benevolence way of becoming a tyrannical dictator. Mm. Interesting. Uh, well, I, I want, I, I'm watching the clock wind down here, and I want to take the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes, if, if you would be. But this, this last show of the month that I do, I, we do a show on Wednesday uh, where I bring a guest in, and we talk about really have what I what used to be a cornerstone of medicine, which is robust, vigorous debate, uh, henceforth, you know, has not been seen for the duration of the pandemic, but Drew and I do it here. But on this last uh, Tuesday of the month, we are starting to unpack what I call the unfuck it bucket, uh, which is how do we fix what has happened during this pandemic? So I'd love to hear your thoughts on everything from, you know, how do we unwind what happened to kids to the accountability issue to, you know, I'm not asking from a medical perspective, how do we uh, you know, help people who have been harmed by these vaccines, but really from your purview, what how do you see us getting out of this so this mm. is where i um weigh my words <laughs> heavily because i do not and to a flaw and to the to the disappointment to the disappointment of some people in the chat sometimes the solution is not and will never be a violent one and the ottawa protest showed us that uh, you you resort to violence you empower the government to do exactly what they wanted to do in the first place in order to have their way with you. The problem becomes when people don't even see the legal, um, the, 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 the lawful protest as a means to effect change when you literally, speaking of a man who loves China, Justin Trudeau in his testimony during the commission investigating his invocation of the Emergencies Act, Trudeau says, I find that you know protest for the purposes of uh, compelling policy change is something that I find worrisome. And then he immediately heard the awfulness of what he said, and then he had to qualify it, you know, do the protest in the right way, and then it's fine. When people feel, and it's the old expression, when, when peaceful protest becomes uh, impermissible, you know, violent protest becomes inevitable, uh, I understand the, 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 the essence of that expression. I just think violence will never be the answer because uh, the government will never turn down an excuse to use more force. Where does it come from? Where, where's the solution going to be? How do you unfuck this? But, but it's funny. I'm, I'm listening to Russell Brand's book, Recovery, and he summarized the 12 steps in, are you fucked? Do you want to get unfucked? Uh, and it, it was a great way of putting it. Yeah. So, like, yeah. um, I've talked how, to him how about that. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's it's and and listening to the audiobook in his voice, it's 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 fan, it's phenomenal. But <laughs> the solution has to be one of raising awareness and taking your damn stubborn neighbor who called you uh, a, a radical extremist during the you know during these last three years right. and say, who's who's the radical extremist now, Mister or Madam Neighbor? I'm actually thinking of one friend in particular. And if you're watching this, you know I'm thinking about you right now. Who's the lunatic now? When you wake people up to the fact that they have been lied to systematically over and over again, you don't need to wake everybody up. You need to wake up maybe 10 to 15% to get them active because the change has to be grassroots from the bottom up. It will not be violent and it will not be from the top down because the top down is corrupt from the top down. And so you wake up some friends, you wait, you have the public discourse. At some point, as the Buddha said, three things cannot long be hidden, the sun, the moon, and the truth. That has to be it. You get enough people to wake up, not all of them, just enough, and then the change will be grassroots to political. I'm not relying on the judicial system. I'm not relying on judges, and I sure as hell am not relying on politicians. It just has to be politically uh, cool. It has to be politically popular to make the change. And the way you do that is by waking up enough people. But the harsh reality is, um, the more we see of what we've been seeing, the more people, are, if they don't get woken up voluntarily, they're gonna get shaken up physically and they're gonna wake up on their own. But that's how you have to unfuck it. There, there has to be a public What do you mean awareness. shaken up physically? I mean, they're, they're, when they start seeing people keel over left, right and center with no explanations, whether or not it's heart attacks related from the stress of the last three years or heart attacks related to, other issues, at some point it's undeniable. When you have the leading cause of death in Alberta being deaths of unknown causes, right. you could be the most stubborn idiot on earth. When, it, when, you, when you know more people who have had issues related to either the, the government measures or the government mandates and not from that to which they were responding, you can't not be woken up unless you just go into hiding, which some people will, like ostrich hiding. Um, but there also has to be some accountability. When, when you have Pfizer, uh, you know, going from 40 billion to 60 billion, whatever their revenues went up, selling a product that they said was 100% was effective, Albert Bourla's April 1st, 2021 email, 100% right. effective. And then later on, they say, we didn't even test for transmissibility. Yes, unfortunately, um, I, people need to um, be held accountable. And I, in my heart of hearts, truly believe people need to go to jail at some point in time for there to be a, an unfucking of this bucket. But uh, I won't hold my breath for that. For the time being, I'm just using my bullhorn to try to wake up even the most dormant of people. No, I, I agree with you. I think there is no healing and there is no moving beyond this uh, without accountability. And there is no accountability without contrition. And there's no there's no forgiveness without contrition. Um, and, and we're a long ways from that right now. Um, you know, we're certainly working from a medical perspective on ways to mitigate the damage that was done. By the way, you know, happy, you know, February 28th is where Drew and I are sitting in California today. The it's over. The emergency is over as of today. Um, it, it's uh, amazing. Some announcements. I don't, buy it. I don't it's believe it. Now, 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 on the federal yeah, level, you know Donald what's going to happen? LA 11. County. It's not. <laughs> yeah. The pandemic. Yeah, and, LA County over. will. will... Yeah, not in LA yeah, County. No, it's, not, it's, it's not over. It's not over on the national level till May 11th. Now down in Florida, where you are, David, it, it ended November 22nd. So you know, I, I mean. The words arbitrary and capricious come to mind. Um, this is oh, yeah, so, so this, oh. ridiculous. Provi there's provincial delineations of, of the science, you know, <laughs> curfew in Quebec, but not in Alberta. It, it, right. it has been an act of stupidity. It's been a Milgram experiment from the very beginning. And yeah. I am not a, um, I'm not an angry, I, I didn't start off as an angry person. I'm not going to ever forget. And I'm not sure that I'm ever going to forgive depending on, on who, it, who, it, who and, and when. Um, but yeah, it, 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 if people don't understand that they have been duped, they, they might never will. But I'm sure it's all going to needle them and, and nudge them and make sure that they, if, if they don't I, I, admit I, it. Listen, that's a hell of a framing. That's a great framing that, that they were, that they were hoodwinked. They were duped. And, and by the way, our people, our leaders were also hoodwinked by somebody before they hoodwinked us and they need to cop to that. But do, give me two more minutes on it being the Milgram experiment and the response to authority. And I'm sure Kelly could do that as well, but I'm gonna let Viva give us a brief sketch on the Milgram experiment. If people don't know what that is. The, the Milgram experiment, uh, Tabarnush, it's, it, that was the shocking one where they were, you know, they, they were turning up the, yes. they had yes. somebody who was In an Yale. unwitting participant and then they had, yeah. everyone else was participating and it was, a, the, the person was allowing someone to get shocked and increasing the increments to the point where they, they knew were doing the shocking. 
Yeah, sorry, they were, they doing, were the doing the shopping at the request. They were pushing the button. So, yeah. the, 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 the 30,000 foot overview is how much will pe- how much will otherwise good people do just because someone in a white lab coat or someone in a, in a, in a military uniform tells them to do it? And the answer is- But that's the why they part, did the Milgram experiment. They were trying to understand how the average German turned into what they were able to do. And uh, listen, you guys, we, there's something just like that going on. We're watching it in real time. It, it, I was in Quebec and they, they implemented the vaccine passport and I went to Canadian Tire and saw that they had citizen security guards asking for your vaccination passport to get into... Oh, you don't know what Canadian Tire is. It's like a Target. It's like a, a, a store that sells fishing stuff. and all. Um, they were asking for citizens. They, the citizens became the willing executioners of the government in real time. Right. And the, 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 the nice, forgiving person in me says, look, you can't get too mad at them they're just doing their job. They've got kids. They don't have the luxury of, of you know, being a loudmouth on, on YouTube or on Rumble. It was YouTube at the time, but on Rumble to, 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 to do this. So they have their own obligations. They have their own pressures. That's how the government subjugates everyone to their control. They get them dependent on the government and all aspects of the government so that they, they never again have the freedom to say no to the government. And these people couldn't say no. They couldn't say no to their employer because their employer couldn't say no to the government. And that's how a government gets But much away. like... M- m- much like there were governors who resisted creating mandates because they did not feel it was their responsibility, there were governors who seemed to relish and enjoy here right. in California, for yeah. instance, doing this and keeping it going. And well, I'm going to lead you through this. I had an experience at the hospital where I've worked for 35 years where I was trying to get the vaccine early on. And uh, I walked in, uh, some, I'm not gonna describe the guy to you, but he had this young, steely-eyed guy, wouldn't let me in the door at first, and then once I got in, I'm a senior physician at this facility, was screaming at me at the top of his lungs, where are your papers? Where are your papers? Right. And I thought to myself, that was, what, December of, of 2019, maybe, or 2020? I, and at that point, I thought, oh, my God. What, did, first of all, I thought, does he enjoy this? Does he enjoy talking to a senior physician like this? And secondly, I yes. thought, oh, we've, we've gone into <laughs> something here. We're, we are really crossing a line. <laughs> Well, a couple of things. First of all, this is not the fir- not the first time in in history when physicians were uh, leveraged to you know perpetrate atrocities uh, on humanity. Uh, our profession, Drew, is not particularly have a uh, a good yep. track record yep. in yep. that way. No. Nope. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you before you go, uh, Viva, is what what role do you think, given your your relationship with Robert Barnes and what you're doing there and your role as an attorney, what what role will lawsuits in your mind, play in our ability to get out of this? So my my um, optimistic belief is that they will play a determinant role in this. Now, when the government immunized Big Pharma with an experimental, I mean, I'm saying the words, an experimental gene therapy um, yeah. thingy thing, whatever the hell it was, because that's what they called it on the NIH, when they immunized their partners in crime, well, they didn't extend that immuni- immunity to employers. And so what has to happen, in my view, is that employers and other entities that were not bestowed immunity from their, you know, their, 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 their loving government need to get sued and it needs to be expensive for them. And that's how they're going to stop doing it. It's the same thing. It's my, my theory with the whole gender affirming care. Once uh, doctors start getting sued for the harm that they are causing, they're going to stop promoting it because right now they're making a lot of money off of it. And so that's what has to happen in my view. And, and some employers are getting sued in the States. Robert Barnes is involved in some of those. And some employers in Canada, are, you know, they're on the verge. The problem is now you have people who believe um, that the government says you can't protest for change. And you have people who believe the entire court system is corrupt. And I can't blame them. In Canada, um, you know, we challenged the quarantine hotels, the government designated quarantine hotels. If you cross the border, you had to go to a, it was a hotel, but you were detained by the government for two weeks for COVID. The court said, that's fine. In Quebec, the court said curfew doesn't, doesn't uh, violate your charter rights. That's fine. So people rightly and understandably believe the entire court system is corrupt, especially since a lot of judges well, are old. To be, to, I, no, and to be fair, though, this was, this was the wrinkle in many of these constitutional republics that in a public health emergency, public health authorities are giving given fiat authority and the, the courts are just ruling on confirming that fact and the reality is our government is contemplating giving that to the world health organization now so they can rule over the whole world right kelly 
Right. Exactly. I mean, that's what's so terrifying is that, you know, we were bad enough on our own. Now we're going to give it all over to Tedros, uh, you know, doctor, not not a medical doctor, Tedros. Um, and, and I just don't see this going anywhere good. So I, I'm actually really um, encouraged to hear you say, Viva, that you think that lawsuits are a possibility. People ask me all the time, you know, will you be able to sue the doctor who did this to you? Will you be able to sue the hospital system? And I have you know, answered that I, I'm not a lawyer, but I think the answer is no, because they will fall back and say they were following the guidance of the CDC or the FDA or whatever other uh, organization. But private companies, you know, can you sue uh, Google for forcing you to have been vaccinated to keep your job? You can, and that's where it will happen. And also that takes time to turn the tide as well, because I was going to say that mm-hmm. judges mm-hmm. by and large tend to be old. They tend to be the very vulnerable people that these measures are intended to protect. So are they going to say, you know, like when they were challenging the mask mandates, uh, sometimes they were in front of judges who were insisting on masks in the courtroom. Good luck trying to get them to declare it unconstitutional. Right. But even that has to start changing as a slow tide where you get one judge like a judge Sickman. I forget now what state it was. Oh, I feel terrible. Stickman was one of the first judges who said, none of these measures make any sense. You can't shut down churches and then allow a, a, a car show because, you know, for, for whatever the reason, yeah. you just need to get a few yeah. of the courageous judges and then others feel like they're not the first nail that's sticking up to get a hammer. It takes time. But also, at a You're given point in time, and you guys... Cur- go go ahead, it. finish that thought. No, no at, at another point, the word at courage, point, which is something that... Go ahead, finish, please. <laughs> so at, at some point in time, it becomes undeniable as well. You, you, when, you ha- when, the bo- when you have CTV news finally saying, you know, oh, well, look at that. We don't have insufficient data to recommend boosters. Well, then you can't hide behind. Uh, we were just following the orders of based on the right. science at the time. At some point, that becomes undeniable. Sorry, Dr. Drew, what were you going to say? You're using the word courage, which is one that I, I didn't know I'd be using on a daily basis these days, but it is, is time for courage. And you're a liberal who is fighting against the excesses of the slippery slope from the liberal side. Where are you running into headwinds? Who You seem very reasonable to me. You're excited about stuff, but you're reasonable. Where are people pushing back on you? Oh, Dr. Drew, I don't think many people are going to agree that I should be called a liberal. In fact, if you look at my Wikipedia page, I think at one point they had far right. I... I, I, I think I don't consider myself liberal or conservative. I think those labels mean nothing now because we espouse views that are you know, necessarily on both sides. I go by red pill versus blue pill, and I am definitely red pill. And I think everyone who's traditionally called conservative or right wing or far right is red pill as well. It's, it's no accident, you know, like just taking you, for example, or some of the people who are <laughs> the most lefty of lefties, Jimmy Dore. Uh, Glenn Greenwald, well, they get called far right the second they get red pilled. So I go red pilled and I'm thoroughly red pilled. I'm just trying not to get black pilled. Um, where yeah. I run into headwind, I, I mean, it's just the demon. They call you names so they can disregard what you have to say. Um, they, they defame you so they can turn you into the extremists so they can then disregard um, your, your otherwise valid points. It's just the easy way of going after the person and not the, the ideas. Um, but I'm very stubborn. I was told as a kid I might have had oppositional defiance disorder. I don't know what that turns into <laughs> as an adult. So, I, a liberal. I, I, yeah, no, so I, I mean, that what I, we're, what I'm facing right now is it's just uh, people dismissing ideas based on uh, a, a demonized uh, description of an individual, and it, it's mm. true with friends and family. I, I, I ran for office in in Canada. I ran for the People's Party of Canada, which gets described as being a racist, misogynist, xenophobic uh, political party, even though I happen to be whatever demographic I am. Uh, So battling the stereotypes that are designed to discredit on uh, identity and not on ideas is the headwind. And the way to do that, the way to beat Mm -hmm. that, keep being reasonable and don't uh, don't succumb to the pressure and don't lash out. Um, But it's also, it's a great motivator. Wow. Well, I'll tell you, it is it, it, wise words. It's it is tough. I, but, uh, again, as someone who was mercilessly censored and canceled, and uh, it was tough some days to not you know, not fight back and not fire back and not, you know, post the inappropriate, <laughs> uh, post <laughs> inappropriate things in an attempt to defend yourself. Um, I, I, may, I may, I may be right. pushing, I may be pushing that line a little bit. I mean, I, when I start swearing <laughs> and I don't do it often, but I, you know, CTV news came out the other day with their article that says 
insufficient data to recommend uh, multiple boosters. And I'm like, right. you effing criminals, you, you spent the last year pushing them already. It's a little late now. Uh, right. So, but that's it. But th there was, uh, I don't know if you, there was a, an incident out of Canada where a journalist had a medical emergency on air. And uh, I, and I look, I, I feel like an asshole asking it, but I said, like, I got to ask the obvious question because I've seen some of your previous tw uh, tweets. You know, what proximity was this on-air medical emergency to your last shot? And then I get called, you know, a conspiracy theory jerk, right, which I understand. Right. Um, but then what ends up happening is her employer, which it happens to be, I think it was CTV News, issues a statement. And I'm like, do you guys don't understand the inherent conflict of interest in the employer who, if it is what many people think it is, could be responsible for this if it resulted from their own mandate? issuing a statement saying it didn't result from the jibby jab, like, <laughs> yeah, there you have it. Well, it makes, well, me well, well, it makes me angry. Well, well, when Damar Hamlin collapsed in cardiac, full cardiac arrest on national television uh, during a football game, people were furious at me when I said, you know, asked the same question, you know, uh, when was his last vaccine? We know he's vaccinated. The question was, when was it? And, you know, people came after me on social media and said, you know, that's privileged, you know, personal health information and you have no right to ask that. And I, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. These are the same people who who demanded that I let every bar owner, you know, and, and you know, every airline know what my vaccination status was for two and a half years. And now, you know, when a guy has a full arrest, you know, and as I said, if you're if you're at the mall in the food court and people around you start vomiting, you've got every right to ask them where they got their lunch. Um, and so I think that, you know, we, we, we have a right to sort of know uh, if there's if there's a clear and present danger out there. Um, and by the way, not just that. Uh, first of all, also, if, if anyone dies of, of covid, the, you damn well know they're going to ask if they were vaccinated. And even if they right. were, but they didn't know they're going to demonize it and blame their death on not getting vaccinated like they did with somebody else. But um, it's not just that you have the right to ask. And this is my this is my um, my deep thought. They have the moral obligation to say it if Correct. they know, it. because w w when if they know that it did happen or suspect that it might have happened by them not disclosing it, they are tacitly and indirectly, if not directly, allowing it to happen to others. And when you have these doctors running hard cover, Commodio Cardis, I think it was, or Commodio Carditis, yes. I forget. Mm -hmm. uh, the one in a million, Commodio the Cardis. one in a million. Right. It's so rare they expect to only read about it in, in, in textbooks. And they then hang their hat on that. They are through hook or crook, through silence or active participation, allowing it to happen to other people who could be uh, spared this this demise if, in fact, that's the causation and correlation. So, yeah, they, they, we that, don't just have the right. Exactly my perfect. point. Exactly. And, and let's say it's not from the vaccine. Let's say it's from COVID. What, whatever it is, it needs to be explained, thoroughly studied. And then the other players need to be screened for these things as well once you've decided that. But you're not allowed to discuss it, period. And by the way, Commodio Cordis almost never happens in adult males and almost never happens with football. So it was a, it's a one in a million that's 10. And when, once you have commotion cordis, you don't stand up and take a couple of steps. That So now you're taking a one in a million and putting a hundred million underneath it. So it's just impossible. And and as I said, I, I love that nobody, uh, with the exception of, of me, I'm a trauma physician by training, and, and Drew had ever heard the term commotio cordis until that happened, and then everyone became an armchair expert. Uh, I've said many right. times, I hope that the, right. nec the next crisis, I hope the next crisis involves something like international financial markets or commodities pricing so that I can weigh in incessantly on things I know absolutely <laughs> nothing about and argue with people who have made their livelihoods and have you know advanced degrees in these things. And it's going to be wonderful uh, because after this experience, <laughs> everybody and their brother is an, is an expert on, uh, on all of these things medical. So Listen, any any last thoughts, Drew? We're, we've kept we've kept uh, being no, here for I, it's been great. We've well kept, over an hour. Yeah, he's been he's been very uh, kind and very generous with his time. Do you have any last See, last thoughts before we wrap this up? Well, I'll just say a secret. I could do this all day, and I do do this all day. I I love it. I love it. But um, <laughs> my my no, my only last thoughts are um, what I've been saying from the beginning. Don't succumb to the temptation to do exactly what they, they are needling people to do, what they want people to do, so they can continue doing what they're doing. Uh, you don't always have to be polite, but you have to stay peaceful and you have to stay lawful. Uh, otherwise, you do give them the fodder. You, you give them every excuse they need right. to do what they want to do anyhow. Where it gets really discouraging is even when you don't do it, they fabricate the excuse and do it anyhow. But uh, when battling monsters do not become the monster and when staring into the abyss... 
What's the Kierkegaard expression? The abyss stares back, so do not become the monster that you are battling in battle. Love it. Awesome. Thank you, Viva Fry. Uh, VivaFry.com. Uh, it's Viva Barnes. Viva Barnes Law. Law dot dot local. <laughs> No, it's vivabarneslaw.locals.com for locals. Vivafry.com is my merch shop. So we're going to see. We're, we'll see if we make. We got beautiful merch right here. Um, but uh, Vivafry <laughs> on Rumble and vivabarneslaw.locals.com. Great. Thank you so much, Aaron Kelly. We'll see you tomorrow at 3 o'clock. Want to give them a little primer on what they're going in for, what we're going to see? Yes. We're having Dr. John Littell, uh, who is a family practitioner, has treated thousands and thousands of COVID patients during this pandemic. He's one of the most dedicated family practitioners, family doctors uh, I've ever known. He is in Florida. Uh, and in addition to his vast experience using early treatment protocols, he really was witness to um, the just the, the tragedy of what happened to patients when they were admitted to the hospital, the fact that they did not get the treatment uh, that he was fighting for, uh, and in many cases were essentially assassinated by, by the hospitals and by their failure and refusal to treat. He just this past week, he lives in Florida, and just this past week, he was escorted out of a medical staff meeting uh, mm -hmm. at a hospital in Sarasota by law enforcement for daring to speak about his treatment of patients with uh, with drugs like ivermectin. Uh, and he, I think it's really worth hearing his story. They have come after him um, personally, and he has more experience than just about anyone I know in treating, successfully treating people uh, for COVID throughout the pandemic. So he'll be with us tomorrow. All and right. then uh, next week, we've Three got uh, Dr. Yep, three o'clock tomorrow, and then uh, Dr. Merrill Nass the the following week. Um, I think that's the eighth. Yeah, March eighth, Wednesday the eighth, and Dr. Nass uh, again has a, a great uh, great story to tell. Her medical board came after her for uh, daring to prescribe some of these medications, these early treatment medications, and remanded her to have a mental health psychiatric evaluation. I mean, this is a la talk about, you know, this is this, you know, Soviet Union cultural revolution stuff. stuff. This is, it, culture, yeah. yeah, cultural revolution stuff, you know, wanted to put her in a psych hospital. Uh, so fortunately, yeah, many of us, including me, mm. fought for her to get uh, her full licensure back, but we'll be hearing from her the following week. Kelly, thank you as always. Uh, I saw also on March 2nd, we had Brian O'Shea and Li Ming Yen. Uh, Li Ming Yen is the, uh, she said some over the top stuff on, I, on Fox News last night, but she has some very interesting information about the virus in China, what studies were going on that she was involved with. And then Brian O'Shea mm -hmm. is a Chinese intelligence expert. And so with her, Susan thought it'd be interesting idea to put those two together and see what we can learn. So we will do that. Absolutely. And uh, Kelly, I'll see you tomorrow at three o'clock Pacific time. Sounds great. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com slash help. Back to your wife. Do you guys still doing some of the cutting and that stuff? Or is <laughs> nah. That, that all stop, right? Yeah. That, so I mean, when, you, I when you go down that path, I feel like things get dark. But you got that's see you you over you doing you're overdoing it. I'm you worried about you. You're my I friend. I don't overdo I it. I just you, see where you no, go with that. But shit. I'm trying to. I I feel like you think I'm crazier than I am. No. Yes. Have I cut my wife and myself and spat blood on each other yeah. when we bone? Yeah. Who hasn't? <laughs>